Hi, I'm Harikiran from Creative India here at Singapore. I'm at the Indian Heritage Center with Nalina Gopal. And over the next 45 minutes, we're going to walk through the show that she has curated. The show is called The Symbols and Scripts, The Language of Craft. Hi, Nalina. Hi. Thank you very much uh, for hosting me, and uh, I look forward to your talk. Thank you for being here. I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about what the exhibition is about before we start walking you through some of the pieces that we have in the exhibition. The star pieces as well as some of the impressive pieces that we've borrowed from other museums. So uh, Symbols and Scripts, The Language of Craft is an exhibition that came about because we wanted to connect Indian diasporas who visit IHC, who are part of Singapore society with their roots. Um, so symbols and scripts because you know several symbolisms that are embedded in Indian culture and scripting traditions as well as language as intangibles have traveled with the diaspora. However, the tangible element of you know crafted traditions and heritage, not all of it has traveled. So we thought it's a wonderful way to bring three of these aspects together and present heritage to the community in a way that would generate some nostalgia yet connections. So in a gist, that's what this exhibition is about. We trace this idea of symbolisms and scripts embedded in handmade objects as far back as the Indus Valley civilization. So let's adjourn to see the introductory section of the exhibition where we've managed to get seals from the National Museum's collection. Wow. Okay, let's go on. So we had the archaeological perspectives introductory section of the exhibition and the important pieces on display here, which are actually the oldest artifacts on display at the center at the moment, are these seals that have been loaned to us by the National Museum in New Delhi. They are seals dating to the Indus Valley Civilization period um, and so they are about 5,000 years old. Um, that's the industry. That's the that unicorn. Yes, that is one of the unicorn seals. So um, the unicorn seal, as you know, is one of the most popularly discovered seals uh, amongst finds dating to the. So this piece, this piece, sorry, to interrupt. This piece is actually what? How many thousand years old? Dates to three thousand BC. Three thousand BC. Okay. So um, like five, so, five thousand um, years. And old. on top of the seal, right at the top, you see symbols arranged there in a script format. So this would be the Indus script, which is the yes. oldest script known of in the subcontinent. Um, the Indus script has been boggling minds of scholars for several years now and uh, it hasn't been deciphered. Yeah. Whereas we don't know what the script or the unicorn, which scholars still debate. They don't know if it was a unicorn or if it was a two-horned animal seen in portrait. portrait. Um, so what, and there's also an incense burner there in terms of the iconography that you see on the seal. Whereas that hasn't been all deciphered. We do know what the seals were used for. They were seals used by traders as independent sort of signatures, they would be transferred to clay tablets and those clay tablets then attached to bags of goods which could include shell workings, greens, etc. Um, on the back of the seal, there's a sort of concave shape there with a hole. Through the hole, a thread would have been put and then the, it would have been worn around the neck of the trader. So it's something that was very personal, it was kept with them. Um, the unicorn seal is, as I was saying, one of the most popular Iconic. seals. And in terms of the script, one of the reasons it hasn't been deciphered is because it's always only been found in a short combination. Secondly, like you see, uh, like you see on the seal, and secondly, the thing is that it's a logosyllabic script, meaning that one character could represent dual meanings, making it extremely complex to decipher. Um, if you look at the smallest seal that we have here, uh, you probably recognize the symbol as something that has Sustika. immense, yeah. uh, you know, importance in both Hindu, Jain, and Buddhist traditions. So it is the swastika, and um, both the swastika as well as the suvastika, which is the anti-clockwise version of it were known during the Indus Valley period. So again, you know, the idea that one symbol could be used in different ways to represent different meanings, making it complex. Also, we thought it's important for, um, you know, uh, the diaspora here to know that this swastika, which is a symbol that they know of and that they have brought with them um, to the places that they have migrated to, um, is something that you can trace as long yeah. as we can remember. Yeah. Nice. So that's the first section, that is archaeological the first section perspectives. Of other archaeological 
pieces um, that are actually from more recent times, uh, found in more recent times, but date as far back as the Sangam period. And That's it has the Tamil some importance yeah. to the Brahmi script, in the Tamil form of Brahmi script, yes. So now we're in the art of writing section. And um, we'd like to tell visitors about the different materials that have been used for writing and the different scripts, and also the idea that script and language are different, that you can use a script to write different languages. Um, so, you know, one of the earliest materials used in the subcontinent is Bojapatra or birch bark. Birch bark. But, you know, in the south, palm leaf was more common and it was also being exported to the north. It was also popular in Sri Lanka. Um, we've borrowed from the National Museum and we've also got pieces that are on display from our own collection. So if you look at number four here, it's a pair of incision pens made in brass, made in Orissa. And um, we, we've placed this here to tell people about how differently scripts were being written on palm leaf. So Orissa and downward you have rounded scripts, yes. so they would be written with incision pens. But if you look at this one here, which is a Bengali manuscript called the Dashakarma Padati, so it's a palm leaf manuscript, um, and the Dashakarma Padati is written with sort of brush or pen and ink. Yeah. Um, this is because, you know, when you write scripts like Devanagari, which require a line to be drawn, you would be scoring the scoring palm leaf the if you were incising it. So they were using different methods, methods. depending on the form of the script. Um, here we have on display different palm leaf manuscripts from our collection as well as from uh, the Asian Civilization Museum's collection. So um, what we like to tell people, one of course, is the different natures of text that were being written. But also that, you know, the palm leaf was a material which promoted scribal culture because you had to keep copying it correct, to correct. keep the text alive because the material itself was not durable. So most of the palm leaf uh, manuscripts are in fact all of them that we have date to the 19th and the early 20th century which also tells us how sort of continuous the history of use of this palm leaf has been. Um, so in terms of the different manuscripts that we have here, we have Balarama Bharatam which is a dance that is written by one of the Travancore Maharajas, so that's in Malayalam. We have this one that I was talking about earlier, Dashakarma Padati in Bengali and the script of course is Devanagari. We have two Sinhalese manuscripts um, oh, in okay. Pali, uh, one uh, that is talking about a uh, medicinal text and the other is a Buddhist text, the Mah Mahasatipatana. And then the last one that we have here, which is very commonly found with the Tamil diaspora that migrated, is a palm leaf manuscript uh, that is a horoscope. Oh, so, okay, you know, yeah. Migrants brought their horoscopes with them. So this one, for instance, belonged to Yegamayachi, who was a Chattiar migrant, who first moved to Malaya and then eventually to Singapore. So her son donated this to us. Her ah. husband had one that was similar as well. Of his horoscope, yes. okay. Um, you know, one of the earliest references to a scribe in Indian tradition is in how the Mahabharata itself has been written. You know, that Vyasa narrated it to Ganesha and Ganesha was his scribe. So we talk about that in the text for the section and of course we have two paper manuscripts, you know, with paper being introduced and especially with its promotion during the Islamic courts, um, you know, it becomes a more popular material. We have some paper manuscripts here. We have two that, uh, you know, borrowed from the mythology and, you know, the Hindu te epics, Ramayana and Mahabharata. So we have a Marathi manuscript of the Ramayana. Um, and we have one here of the Mahabharata again. Um, and we can see that both have illustrations. Now, this one is rather interesting because the illustration is in the Tanjo style, uh, oh. done probably during the Maratha rule of Tanjo. So you have Tanjo paintings of Mahabharata Vishakam and Sita and Rama's wedding. So, so how old is this? Uh, these ones are rather recent, they are 18th century. Okay. So, um, you know. And lastly, we have here, now as I was saying, paper was a medium that the Islamic courts were promoting, and especially during the rule of Akbar. Um, you know, so Akbar was promoting Persian manuscripts being written of other, you know, uh, religions and faiths yeah. as well to promote sort of uh, understanding. So here, for instance, we have one that was produced during Maharaja Ranjit Singh's time um, after what was done in uh, Akbar's time. So it's a Persian manuscript of the Bhagavad Gita. Oh, okay. Yeah. So and the illustration you see is of Krishna giving Vishwarupa to Wow, okay. Arjuna. <laughs> yeah. That's nice. Yes. So we'd like to remind people of the subtle sort of, you know, um, syncretic, syncretic uh, qualities yes, yes, yes. that art represents as well. And lastly, the material that we feature is cloth. 
so we have two woven examples here both incidentally woven by muslim weavers uh -huh. for um, you know hindu communities that one definitely woven for the priests of benares so it's a kashmiri shawl woven with inscription throughout um, so running from bottom to up you have repetitive inscription saying shri vishwanath ganga you know noting the patron deity as well as mm -hmm. the most important river there um, and you will see that it's been woven it with extreme skill from both sides so you see in the front as well as in the reverse showing us how complex you know their use of technique was as well wow on this side we have a banarsi brocade so it's been woven again you know entirely it's a gold tissue rep with repetitive inscriptions reading hare rama hare krishna and you have repetitive icons featured here of radha and krishna as well so again you know the idea that it's been woven for communities of a particular faith by yeah by another faith because art sort of you know transcends, transcends all of this we spoke about some of the different manuscripts that we have there and then here we also talking about why writing was being done why you know uh, some of these art forms were thriving as well was because there was a storytelling tradition in many parts of india and we have two examples here um, the one behind us is actually um, all in velvet with gold thread embroidery done in surat oh yeah all of the writing is actually cuneiform so you can definitely tell that there's a west asian influence here It tells the story of darius the great and on the backing there's gujarati inscriptions hmm. so you know the connection is really the parsi community here and this would have been used as a backdrop for parsi theater performances um so you know in singapore too in the early years in the early 20th century there was parsi theater but it has hmm. disappeared so ah. we thought it would be a nice way to remind people yeah, of this yeah. tradition that has been there in the past and this is from what um, uh, telangana on the yes Pradesh. it's from telangana and uh, it's a cotton painted scroll which tells the story of the padmasali weaving community it would have been commissioned by the community from a local artistic uh, you know community as well um, it would have been used as a storytelling aid when it was brought around to tell the story okay, of the padmasalis okay okay um, the of the padmasalis of the okay padmasalis. so it's about 9 meters long but of course we don't have adequate space here to display the entire painting so we show you about 4 meters and the uh, the prime protagonist is bhavana rishi mm -hmm. who is their progenitor and the myth goes that you know um, sage markandeya summons him and he emerges from fire holding a ball of thread and the ball of thread is said to have emerged from the navel of vishnu so they're tracing their descent to oh to vishnu to oh okay okay um yet again here now this is a scene where he's on route to kailasha to see shiva and he's riding a tiger which shiva has asked for so um he's now in oh, he's taking the tiger over, okay yeah, and he's going to turn victorious and he'll proceed and you can see him here with shiva so um the idea is that when he arrives in kailasha with shiva seeing the tiger the skin separates and that's how he has his tiger skin so again they're sort of claiming their descent to wow. shiva as well <laughs> and you know for us to remember that some of these artistic communities extremely talented but perhaps not very high up in the social ladder and ah. these were ways that they, they were they able were to sort to, of oh, wow. endorse their own position also because it is the story of a textile related community the visual culture here is so rich yes. um all of the attention to detail in terms of costumes is tremendous so you know it makes it a visually stunning piece um now this piece is on loan this us this craft is still alive in um not so much no but in terms of a uh, painted scroll tradition the cherial tradition is more alive you have crafts people still hmm. working on it um so in terms of this painting unfortunately this is on loan to us from the asian civilizations museum now unfortunately at the day right at the end of the painting usually there's a panel that would have had script Ah, script, okay. Which would have noted when this was painted, who the artist was, and a little bit more information. Details, you know. However, in this one, except for a few remnants of Telugu characters, the inscription does not survive. 
but there is a comparable example in the British Museum's collection, uh, yeah. based on which this has also been dated to the second half of the 18th or the early 19th century. Early so, 19th century. Yes, okay. So okay. Um, that that one has the information in that. So script plays an important role. Uh, Wait, which British Museum? Uh, museum is this? Only only one. Uh, the in British in ah, okay. Okay. Oh, in London. Okay. From here, I'd like to talk about how writing was also an important artistic outlet. So especially in uh, Islamic culture, the portrayal of form was taboo. So the word itself took on artistic character, it became an artistic outlet, and calligraphy is, is a very important artistic yes. form. Um, and it's not just that, it's also that you know the word itself had the power to transform an object from profane to sacred and uh, perhaps even have healing power. So we, I'm going to show you two examples here. Um, one is on loan to us from the National Museum and the other from a private collector in Singapore called Peter Lee. Um, so here we have an abkura. Abkura is Persian, the word, and it means water vessel. So this is one of the most complete examples, which is in the Bidri tradition, which comes oh, from okay. the Deccan region. Deccan, yeah, yeah. It's one of the most complete examples because it has the bowl, the lid, as well as the saucer. Now, if before I talk about the inscription, you know, if you look at the aesthetics of the lid as well as the saucer, it has quite close resemblance to the trade textiles that have been coming out of Masli Patnam, etc., mm -hmm. that area. So it's the poppies. So there's some sort of artistic connection between the oh. communities that are making textiles as well as this. Now, if you look at the inner circumference of the bowl, um, you'll see that it's completely inscribed in Arabic and the innermost circle is proclaiming Allah as the healer. So the belief was that if you drank water from this bowl, you would be healed mm. of whatever ailments yep. you had. Um, the same idea comes across here where this textile seems to have talismanic properties. So it is a brocade, but it's a brocade on cotton. And each of the medallions there has the inscription Al Afia, okay. meaning you know good health be bestowed on the wearer. So again, the belief that if you had this textile upon you, you know wearing it, then you would be protected. Wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. The same idea. Here again, you know, this is a cotton. Store. So let's take a step back and just. Yes. So we, we had the archaeological perspectives yes. and then the art of writing. Yes. And then the sacred word. Yes. Now We're we still move in on the to sacred word. Sacred word. Section. Ah, okay. So this is so, still uh, okay. I'm just going to quickly talk ah, about okay. this piece and then we'll move on. So this is a hand-dyed cotton stole with khadi print or you know silver ink print, and each of the medallions here has the word Allah. Mm. Again, you know, the idea that the word had protective powers, that it could transform a profane textile into something, something that had protective sacred, powers. Yeah. It was talisman. So this is cartography, cosmology here, and astronomy. We are moving to um, another aspect um, where we are looking at cartography and cosmology as well as astronomy. I'm going to talk about cartography um, because that's one of our star pieces here. Now some of the oldest maps that you know we know of in India are from the pilgrim map tradition and these are largely you know from both the Hindu and Jain traditions. So we have one example each from these traditions and um, one piece that is here behind me is a Satrun Jayapata. So mm -hmm. it's a cloth painting and it's a cloth painting made in the Jain tradition. The idea was that such cloth paintings would serve as visual surrogates for pilgrims who could not visit the actual site. Um, Satranjaya is a very important pilgrim site because it is the place of enlightenment of the first Jaina Adinata. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it is a very important complex for the Jains. However, if you look at this painting itself, you'll understand that the topography is quite inclement. You have rivers at the bottom of the hill, there are several shrines. So, it is quite difficult for, say, somebody who is aged to navigate. So uh, the idea was that such cloth paintings would be specially commissioned. Um, if you look at the inscriptions, there are different people acknowledged here as donors. As donors. So we know that it would have been different members of the community who came together to have this commission. And then, you know, it would be hung in a Jain temple that's near a people's home so that they can visit and earn the same amount of merit 
as visiting Shatrunjaya itself. Uh, ah, so, oh, oh, I see. So, distributed pilgrimage. Yeah. Ka hai. Wow. <laughs> now, here we have a sort of a map, a topographic Kashi. study of the Ghats of Benares, Kashi. And again, the inscriptions give us the names of the temples and the shrines. Um, so, you know. Um, oh, these are all the. Yes in Devanagari. Both give us the inscriptions in Devanagari. So you so treat this as a map, basically. That's what you mean, yes. cartography. Okay. Yes, we treat these as maps. Um, and they're almost infographic-like, yeah. if Info you look at it. <laughs> it is an info, yeah, I mean, the contemporary, contemporary It is an infography, yeah. It is. And it's just wow, I mean, actually visual it's ima imagery yeah. behind it that comes together and how script has been subtly woven into it. And of course, we want our collection and, you know, this is a not particularly an easy subject to communicate to children. So wherever we can, you know, there is something that is introduced to make the collection more accessible to children. So here, for instance, there's a puzzle. Oh, okay. So you made this yeah, for this, this show? Yeah, this was a puzzle made you for this just, show. Oh, yes. okay. So, you know, wow. children can solve it. As you can see, somebody has managed to Whose idea was this? Um, it's our education team. Ah, yes. wonderful. <laughs> We're slowly shifting to talking more about symbolism in uh, tradition. And you know, again, with the diaspora, one of the things that has traveled with them are performing traditions. Correct. Um, and uh, you know, they're all still connected with some of the dance forms or you know, music forms that they know of. And it's a very important way for them to keep in touch with their roots. Several children go for classes to learn these performing art yeah. forms. So we thought it's nice to sort of incorporate these elements because it would also help bring in programming aspects that could augment the exhibition. True. So here we are in the behind the mask section, the idea being that the mask, once you have a mask on, uh, you represent something other than yourself. And in many ritual dance forms, it also sort of allows the transformation, you know, in terms of spirit uh, transfer and all of these things. So, you know, we talk about these different ideas here. And we have four uh, masks. Is that also a mask? Here. It is. Um, I'll tell you about why there's a mirror fixed there in a little while. So this one is a Purlia Chow mask. It comes from Bengal, West Bengal. Yeah. And it's of Kali, which is why you know you have her lid from below. We have uh, a Tayyam mask. So Tayyam is performed. It's a ritual form that's performed in the north of Kerala, in the Malabar region, usually, um, you know, in uh, Kannur district area. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is where they have Bhagavati worship, so it's uh, dedicated to the female goddess, and it's always male performers who are uh, performing there. And this is a bronze mask for Tayyam performance. So, for instance, when the exhibition launched in the opening week, we had Tayyam performers come down. And they actually and wear they actually this and perform. dance it. Oh, okay. This particular one is an older version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we have two uh, examples from Karnataka as well, from the Bhuta dance uh, tradition. Um, this one is more of a decorative, decorative form, so it's much larger. Now that one is actually one for Kola Bhuta mask uh, performances. So if you say, um, you know, where the mirror is, it shouldn't be there. It was added by the person who owned it before us. We decided to keep it because it does something lovely when, you know, if you step back, you can see yourself wearing the mask. So uh -huh. it, it sort of is... is oh, yeah. Is quite nice <laughs> in terms of display, but usually the face would have been inserted there and then painting would complete the masking process. So um, that's what that is, and it's in silver. Nice. And you can see because the snake or the naga is very much propitiated in this region, you find that it's very much part of the iconography that has been incorporated as well. Nice. And from performance, we're moving to play, and uh, we start talking about play. Uh, and how this idea of play is actually embedded in Hindu tradition and mythology and um, religion. So here, for instance, we are right at the end of the gallery here. So we have a pitchvai. A pitchvai is a cloth painting that's uh, unique to the Nakdwara tradition, mm -hmm. where it's hung at the shrine behind the deity, indicating what time of uh, you know the season, what time of year, or what activity he's engaged in, because it's believed that he's a living deity and that he's very much living everyday life. So here we have a cotton oh, paint, okay. uh, you know, painting uh, of uh, Krishna, Radha, and a gopi engaged in water sport. The idea being that you know we're saying that this so it's like a scuba diving. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the entire thing is a lotus pond. Yeah. This is again from Andhra Pradesh. Oh yes, this one is. So um, this is actually part of the performance section. Uh, you know where we. Sorry, I'm partial to Andhra Pradesh. I'm from Andhra. I know. So. I should have stopped here. <laughs> so 
Um, here, you know, we, we are talking also about the leather uh, yeah. tradition. So this is actually a scroll made in the same tradition as the leather uh, tradition. So they're from Anandpur, the puppet makers, mm. and they're both the makers of the puppet as well as the performers. And, you know, their usual narrative is determined by the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, and all of their folk traditions as well. And you can see how script has been included here, and it's Sita seen. Yeah. The Maya man, wow. my idea here. Phenomenal. It's from the Ramayana. Going back to the idea of play, here we have a rather special object that's been loaned to us by an up and coming museum in Bangalore called the Museum of Art and Photography. Um, they have very interesting. This is very kish kind of thing. It's very kish. And um, here it's, it's a specially commissioned mobile shrine. Um, you know, if you look at it in terms of uh, the cutouts here, a lot of them are from the Ravi Verma press. And then you have scenes from hell, have possibly two sort of British figures here, and then all of the Hindu deities way above. So, you know, in terms of uh, hierarchy, is yeah, like, hierarchy, okay. You see that. But if you <laughs> step um, this way, you can see what happens. So, this box is also special because of the mechanics involved. Behind, there's a little keyhole when a key is inserted. Ken, if you'd like to come this side, you can see what happens wow. to the figures when the key is turned. But there's a subtle element of play that is being worked into this box. Nice. But this is a, this is a good element. <laughs> so play and craft. So this is also play and craft. Yes. Yeah. The um, different kind. And here we'd like to remind visitors, you know, several children visit us and they play board games every day. But they don't know that it's actually part of their heritage, you yes, know. Yes. Um, and we'd like to remind them that games like Ludo, for instance, Chaupar was known as far back as the Indus Valley period and was inscribed on potsherds found from that time period. Um, or snakes and ladders coming from Gyan Chaupar or Paramapadam as we know it. And also, you know, um, chess, all of these games come from Indian tradition from the early years of the common era. So, um, you know, you here you see a Gyan Chaupad board in cloth and uh, made in the Jain tradition. So Gyan Chaupad meaning a game of knowledge and the idea being that the snakes sort of represent uh, obstacles in life in the form of sins, etc. But if you transcend them, you would attain moksha or salvation. So there was a lot of philosophy behind these Very interesting actually. Never that, think of it that way. Yes. but. And um, here again, you know, we have Ganjifa card. So Ganjifa is a game that came from Persia to India. It died out there, but it has, you know, survived in India. But largely today, as a decorative form, uh, it's a crafting industry. So we have two sets here: one from Savantwadi, which is in Maharashtra, and then one from Orissa. And you can see that we have a Ramayana Ganjifa set as well as a Dashavatar Ganjifa set. And in the Ramayana cards, which are the smaller cards, you'll see that you know different monkey figures and ogres have been arranged in certain numerical values, so that the card themselves then represent a certain numerical numerical value. Mm -hmm. Very interesting how wow, these okay. have been created. They're all hand painted. Um, and lastly, we have some dolls here. You know, there are several doll making industries across India, like Chennapatna, etc. So um, this particular one, they're wooden dolls made in southern India. Here we'd like to talk about the symbolism, you know, behind all of these doll making traditions, the idea that a doll is actually something that's used to introduce children to everyday life and the life that's around them. So here, you know, a subtle way to introduce the idea of music and dance to them. It's a musical troupe with a lead female dancer. Nice. Um, you know, in terms of fashion too, when we talk about everyday life, fashion is another aspect. But we see that there's a lot of symbolism that has been embedded in what crafts people are creating, be it in textiles or jewelry. So here, for instance, if you look at the jewelry that we display, um, if you take the manga mal, which is a necklace made with mango motif, uh, you know, it's it's something that can be traced. The design itself of a manga mal can be traced at least as far back as the Chola period, as you see it in the sculptures of that time. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, we are in Singapore, and we'd like to remind visitors that the name Singapore itself yeah. has Indic roots. Um, you know, from Singapura, it's old that Correct. name. So we have Singha motif earrings here, so that we can talk about some of these ideas. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and remind people of the civilizational links between the regions that we are occupying today and then, you know, where we come from. So the idea is to use the symbolism to talk about these as well. Now in terms of textiles, 
color is one way to introduce symbolism mm -hmm. and this is called a mama patte a mama patte you know the word mama means maternal uncle yes. and in tamil patte means silk so these are cloths that are specially commissioned for the chettiar community and it's especially worn by the maternal uncles of the bride and groom during the wedding okay it helps to identify the maternal uncle because he has specific rituals that he uh, has to perform. We have, so, we have to carry the, yes, so yeah, the bride. Yes, yeah, yeah. fashionable and still <laughs> is fashionable. And these were specially woven in Kashi or Benares for the Chetia community. So wow. we have an older example where initials have been in, you know, inscribed because the Chetias always mark their personal possessions with initials. They come usually from large uh, joint families and that way you know, ownership is very clear. And that's a more recent example that has been woven in recent wow. times. Wow, nice. Now, the sari and the dhoti are two of the most ubiquitous drapes and we have two examples here on loan to us from the Museum of Art and Photography, both that have been heavily inscribed. Now, both of these would have been part of a bridal trousseau and, um, you know, you can tell from the grandeur as well. Um, and I'm going to talk about one of them. It gives us a sense of the patriarchal society mm -hmm. that could have been commissioning these kind of saris. So, if you read the inscription, it says Pati Seva Nari Dharam. Um, if you want me to translate it, of course, means serving your husband is your wifely duty. So, you know, it sort of gives you a sense of what. Uh, yeah, at that time, what was demanding the. demanding of the woman. And how that has, of course, changed with time. But, you know, this idea of script being included, included in, in the sari is a tradition that you find, uh, you know, in practice up to about the independence period and then slowly it disappeared. But now it's being revived. So there's a Sada Saubhagyavati Bhava Sari that, you know, the Dastakari Hat Samiti has, for instance, commissioned in recent times. Okay. So this idea of using script so that the craftspeople who not always had had formal education but they came from more informal sectors so you know the use of script to introduce back uh, literacy to them is something that we talk about in the exhibition and I'll come to that a little later. So you call this section fashion forward? Yes forward because fashion is always repeating itself and we are all constantly bringing I saw I saw something there with uh, India is Akhand Bharat. Yes we can we can see that. I, I, it's very interesting that uh, yes. Here the idea is we're talking about how fashion itself. Some uh, people still want it is, back. Is, <laughs> this is on. <laughs> uh, so I won't comment on that. But you know, in terms of uh, this skirt itself, it is a symbol of the nationalist movement. You know, so these have been. Uh, I'm saying these because it's a pair, and we'll look at that in a moment. But these are brocade skirts, um, and uh, specially commissioned. And you can. But I'm see surprised how the even Burma and all that is yes. that Thailand, Malaysia. I mean. A little That's bit of it. So, a little bit of that. Know, um, so it Can I have a shot of this? It is being woven in by the craftsperson uh -huh. only at the spe specific request. And you see that it's both Akhand Bharat as well as its mirror image that has been woven in. So, you know, it's definitely making a statement. This has been made yeah. in the 1930s. Nin okay. Um, so, you know, it is the national spirit. National spirit, yeah. You know, um, making such a public statement of your loyalty also meant that you must have had a lot of courage. Uh, you know, case there were any repercussions. Correct, correct. But it's clearly somebody who's making their nationalist loyalties. It's Clear. very, very obvious. Yeah. Nice. And on this side, we have a skirt that is and pointing the, the Indian flag. Indian. Ah, okay. the but yeah, so, so then obviously, yeah. again, right, what is the date of this? This one also is about the nationalist period as well. So again, something that, you know, comes about in that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So interesting how you can look at fashion. Now we've been looking at it from the nationalist perspective, but you know, fashion is also something that's determined by society and politics, right? And just the way nationalism was defining it. The colonial period was also defining um, what craft was being produced, not just fashion, but otherwise as well. So we have here, for instance, an example of Kanta embroidery. Kanta embroidery is unique to the West Bengal region and it's done usually by women folk um, and they very much borrow from the scenes around them. So here for instance there is a scene of village life but what do you find that's unusual? You find right in the middle there is a missionary figure seated 
with a book called, saying Almighty God, possibly <laughs> a Bible, and then you see European figures on horses alongside other scenes that are typical of village life. So it tells you what's very much preoccupying um, society around them and where they're drawing their imagery from. So we're now moving towards talking about imagery and the patterns that exist and the motifs and what symbolisms they represent. So here, for instance, of course, it's symbolic of colonial life. Yeah, proselytization um, was there at the yes, time. Yes, yeah. and um, you know, in terms of how the image is created, what is it that they are drawing this inspiration from? from? Where are they getting their references from? Is it from text? Is it from music? Is it from astrology? So here, for instance, we have a miniature painting on loan to us from the National Museum of the Ragmala series. So mm -hmm. It's of Ragini Telingi, who is supposed to be the consort of Raga Hindola. Okay. And Hindola is associated with the swing, so you see that here. Now, um, and on this side, we have an incomplete Ganjifa card set of the zodiac sign. Okay. Um, so, you know, again, how was the zodiac visualized? What is the form given to it? What is the image they have created? This is something we talk about here as well, because when we talk about symbols, it's also what is the form of this symbol and how has that come about? Not just what it represents, but how it looks. We talk about these patterns, we say perfection because perfection. this immense amount of perfection Detailing. that has been achieved even though it's been made by hand and um, you know here we actually look at different examples each being inspired by nature or even geometry for instance. I'll talk about number 11, it's actually a special piece in our collection. It's a barutdan. So, you know, it's actually a flask for gunpowder mm -hmm. and um, it's made to look entirely like a nautilus creature. So it has a very strong reference to the sea. So, okay. you know, in that way it looks like a shell or a mollusk, um, you know, and then you find that mother of pearl ivory has also been used to sort of reinforce that idea and it's made entirely of wood otherwise. And in terms of the lid, it has a gourd. Um, so, you know, all of this re reference from nature is very strong here. This is highly decorative. It would have definitely been commissioned for somebody who is nobility and above because, you know, it, it would have had sufficient expense attached to it. Um, and these kind of, opt these kind of uh, barutans would have been made in this tradition by uh, members of the Khatri caste in Rajasthan, typically, who are craftspeople as well. You know, we were talking about the mango, so for here, here for instance, we have a bidri hookah base, um, also in the mango tradition, mango shape. So again, we're talking about how the mango has several sort of pan-Indian references, and how that is a ubiquitous shape that you see um, in terms of a motif in several Indian uh, traditions. Because a lot of these traditions, be it the lotus, the makara, the naga, the fish, etc., you see in many Indian uh, objects, textiles, or even architecture that you find in Singapore. But we'd like to remind people of the symbolism that's attached. We were looking at patterns, you know, but we'd also like to talk about how these patterns have had an influence outside of India. Mm. And we're in Southeast Asia, so here we bring to you South textiles made in India for the Southeast Asian market. Um, so I'll start with this one, which is the oldest one that's here, dates to the 15th to the 17th century. And you can see block printed onto it the geese or the hamsa motif. Mm -hmm. um, which was a very popular motif exported to especially the Indi Indonesian region. Okay. Um, behind that, you have a dodot. Now, dodot is actually a fabric that would have been worn around the waist um, by men and largely by the royalty because trade textiles of this sort were reserved for nobility or royalty. You had to be of a certain stature to wear it. So, Indonesian royalty would have. And this particular motif, the waterfall motif, um, so it's why it's called Deep Deja, Deep Tanadi, was very popular in the Balinese and the Javanese context. So, um, you find that this is something that has outlasted even you know the period of export of British goods to Southeast Asia where now local production of textiles is happening this motif has lasted and continues to have influence even today and then here for instance we have a hand-painted uh, Buddhist 
a manuscript wrapper. It's from and Thailand, is it? It's made for the Thai market, made in India for the Thai market. And you can see that all the celestial figures drawn here are extremely Thai in appearance. Yeah. So they were able to adapt and cater to the markets they were supplying to and modify their motifs as well, which is why they were immensely popular. Not just the patterns that they were traditionally producing for the local markets, but they but could also produce get new the ones designs. that were going for the So uh, they were they were getting the designs markets. and then yes, doing it were, as well. They were looking at it and then producing. Now one of the other uh, one of the traditions that was very popular for Koromandel Coast textiles was Kalamkari as we know yeah. it today, or you know, hand painted cloths. And here, for instance, we've created this contemporary crafting skips platform where we borrowed pieces from the Dastakari Had Samiti's Akshara project mm. which was uh, you know a special project that was I was saying earlier was used to introduce the idea of literacy back to craftspeople by asking them to include calligraphy in their works so here for instance we have a kalamkari of Jaya 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 was behind this and here you have the tree of life motif which was again a popular motif in uh, export cloths made for the Southeast Asian market and it's been done by master craftsperson Niranjan so um, you know and you can see how he has included Telugu calligraphy everywhere mm. and it's making reference all of the words to the motifs that you find traditionally in Kalamkari. So you know this is something that uh, is beautiful. Niranjan is also going to be coming down here in the month of April. Oh, okay. so, you know, as part of this exhibition, we've created a Crafting Indian Scripts platform where over about six and a half months, we have 14 craftspeople as well as calligraphers identified with the help of Dasakari Hat Samiti and Jaya Jaitliji who are coming here and each of them is here for two weeks to demonstrate their craft and how they use script in their craft because we'd like people to know that it's not just the end product but the process itself that is equally important and the transmission and the idea of appreciating these is what is going to keep these traditions alive. Also, we wanted people to understand that, you know, what they see in the past perspective is also relevant today because several of these crafting communities continue to exist continue to. and they're producing these things and it's only by appreciating it can and, you know, patronizing it can we see a thriving existence of these. One of the other contemporary pieces that I'd like to point out to you is this one. So we were looking at a storytelling aid earlier for instance, this Telangana cotton scroll. Here we have a kavad. A kavad is actually traditionally made in Rajasthan. They're portable shrines or altars shrines, yeah. uh, made by the Sutar community who are carpenters and they then paint them. So, and usually the shrine would have, you know, um, seen say from the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, oh, okay. local. So, this is a contemporary version. Yeah, this is a contempt or local sort of legends um, um, or deities. So, here you have a contemporary version by Satinara and Sutar, who is the craftsperson, and he is actually telling his own story and journey here. So, oh, for okay. instance, here, sorry, can you edit that out later? So, for instance, here you find that he is actually, you know, juxtaposing imagery of him having to learn to use a computer alongside his traditional craft of a carpentry workshop and all of this. Just the challenges that a traditional craftsperson is undergoing in contemporary society. Also that of migration, for instance, from more rural parts of India to the cities. And you see here, for instance, you know, oh. families oh. migrating. Um, so just the challenges that these craftspeople are having and questioning their own position in society is something that he's addressing through his craft and there is script included in this he's so made this for you or he uh, just this made is actually made for the akshara project ah, we okay. have had a special one made for us that's traveling so it was shown at kala utsavam at uh, the esplanade for instance in november so it's a contemporary art meets craft yes yes <laughs> it is so I'll take you from here because some of these uh, uh, pieces here are going to be rotated. So as and when the craftspeople come, we will put up some of their works as well. So I'll take you now to the Crafting Indian Scripts platform. So we are the Crafting Indian Scripts uh, platform where I was saying earlier that over the six and a half month period, we have 14 over craftspeople coming from India to demonstrate, as well as calligraphers, to demonstrate the use of script in their particular craft form. Oh. So currently, we have a master crafts person in Pepia Meshe from Kashmir, Fayaz Ahmad Janji. Uh, Fayaz Bhai is also, uh, you know, uh, very, very good in calligraphy. So you can actually sit down here, spend time, wow. understand the process of making such beautiful 
objects that we see in a store and perhaps don't understand the labor behind it and the talent behind it. So this is a place for you to actually understand how these interact with them. Okay, with that's the nice. Interact with people and also for them because the craftspeople, unlike say contemporary artists, are not signing the objects they are making, correct, correct. and their identity is often forgotten. Oh, forgotten. And this is our way of showcasing them and giving them their fantastic. Due respect well. So, so they come in uh, slots they come of two in weeks. Slots of two weeks. Yes. Ah, wonderful. So every two weeks, if you came back, you would see a different craftsperson. Wow, here. that's good. Um, we wanted something that was specific to Singapore, that would be a special commission that's unique to this exhibition. Um, so, and we also wanted it to be made in Singapore with some material that was unique to Singapore. So, uh, here we are at an installation called Ode to the Unknown by the artist Madhvi Subramaniam, who's based yeah. in Singapore. Which I know, is I know her. She's a friend of mine. Yeah. From Bombay. So, Madhvi is a ceramic artist, and her studio is incidentally based in one of the last two remaining dragon kilns oh, okay. in Singapore. So the dragon kiln is actually a technology that came with Chinese immigrants to Singapore. And um, it is where rubber collection cups, latex collection cups, were being produced. Um, okay. And these, while oh, they were being the cups produced, which collected the latex. while they okay. were being made by Chinese migrants, the end users were largely Indian workers who were employed at the rubber plantation. So oh, okay. if you look at oh, okay. here, it shows you how these cups would have been tied to the base of the tree and when it's tapped then the sap collects in the cup. Mm. And you can see largely the you know the workers at the rubber plantation were Indian migrants and this was a mass phenomenon and thus to a large extent defined movement of labor diasporas to Singapore, Malaya and even Burma. So we thought it would be a nice installation that would be symbolic of migrant experience in this part of the world. So the cups, of course, originally only had an ash glaze, so they were very grey looking. She saw these cups at IHC and that's where her inspiration came from. This is her interpretation of the cups. Um, and all of these cups, collectively about 520 over of them, are any, old any to... Any 520s, there's any concept behind it? No, not really. <laughs> how much our space could, um, she wanted to have a lot more and there was a numerical concept to it but unfortunately space, space doesn't allow. But in terms of the colour itself, the symbolism is a reference to Little India and its vibrant colour scheme. So she's drawn from the architecture. But also if you look at the half uh, sort of half spiral that has been worked into it, that's the rubber falling that she's in. Painted, um, that's the half spiral that you see etched onto the tree there, so she's drawn a reference there, but I also interpret it as a sort of a circle of life that she as a migrant is doing an installation about migrants past, sort of connecting sure. past and present. Um, and uh, you know, it is rather unique to the exhibition and uh, we thought it would be a nice offering. No, it's to lovely. I mean, Madhvi's work is always... Uh, yes. Um, and Very also good, the yeah. other thing is that there is no script here but her signature is here so where she holds the cup and dips them into the glaze you see her fingerprints left behind. For, oh for everyone. For ah, every okay. Ah, okay. So that's her signature and also the terracotta colour that you see on this cup is actually a slip. It's a slip of Singapore clay into which she has dipped each cup so there is Singapore Sorry, sorry come again, come again. Singapore clay, um, clay from Singapore that was watered down and then turned into a sort of a slip into which the cup was dipped, so each of them also has a layer of Singapore clay in them. Uh -huh. yes. We also invite... Very nice. Yes, yes of course, I need, would... A sort of an ode, a message Yes. the rubber planter, the unknown rubber planter of the past, unknown because this is such a mass experience that we don't really remember each individual rubber planter, which is quite a tragedy because each of them... But some of these rubber plantations are also in Malaysia, right? Yes, they were in Malaysia, there were so some in Singapore, some, several in Malaysia and several in Burma. Mm. Uh, and you know, so we, we thought this region, when you look at migration, it's very much interconnected because movement out of India, you know, if you, for instance, if you came from Calcutta, the ships came via Burma. If you came, you know, out of India, many of them arrived in Malaya and then to Singapore. So it's all very much interconnected. So we thought this was, a rep this was an installation that would actually evoke uh, connections for people who had roots in the region, not just in Singapore as well. So if you'd like to leave your mind. Sure, I will. I'll collect my thoughts and then I, I, yes. will, I will after the... Yes. But uh, I, I really like Madhavi's leaving that, uh, I mean, she, 
in some pieces I know uh, her work, yes. she not necessarily leaves a f uh, fingerprint, no, no. but it, it sort of ties in very well with uh, uh, you know what your team is yes. in terms of uh, leaving her print, her imprint, imprint yes. yeah, a symbol. Yes, and I like that. Uh, the half spider. Yeah, it's, it's a the, it's a multi-layered uh, installation. Yes, very nice. Um, one one other important thing to notice in the installation are the archival photographs themselves. Mm -hmm. These are from the collections of the National Museum in Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one or two from the National Archives as well. Um, and you can see how, you know, the Indian uh, rubber planters were not just men, but they were also women. women yeah. And I think that was a hu uh, huge personal connection for Madhvi when she saw the photo of the woman, she was really thrilled that there were women on the plantation. And she had a message for women of the past as well. So there are many layers to this installation. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, you know, um, I think apart from its vibrancy and the material itself, Tell me, I mean, this is just a fascinating uh, experience and the way you have curated it and conceptualized it. And I'm trying to put, I'm trying to understand what went in your mind mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how you've uh, put together the, all the sections. Uh, so you want to tell me about it, what kind of research you did, uh, okay, what's I mean, the kind of team? and collections research. Um, you know, we are definitely looking at. How did you? Uh, my, 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 I'm thinking is, I, as you walked me through this, yes. and and you had uh, cartography, you had yes. patterns of perfection, you had these play uh, textiles, and so you had different sections. Uh, so how much was so when you when when this brief came to you, like, you know, let's do a symbols and craft show. So piece, how did it start? I mean, how it started was that we wanted to do an exhibition on crafting traditions, on handmade traditions. But then, you know, that seemed like something that would be very sort of generic. Okay, this object is yeah. from here, this is from here, this is from here. We didn't want it to be so sort of obvious. We wanted there to be depth. Yes. And at the same time, we wanted there to be a visual experience that would be out of the ordinary and thirdly also things that people could connect with easily even though there's depth we're not complicating matters for you it's quite simply communicated so that was that was some three sort of determining factors for coming up with this so symbols and scripts that's how it came about of course we've had negotiations with different institutions to see what collections we can borrow um, some of them you know we've been extremely successful in getting everything we asked for and in others of course our lists were cut down so but you know how we can actually weave all of it together to tell one composite narrative is what you see here i can't really tell you what runs in my mind it's <laughs> But you know, there are some people here who can do wow. how we oh, work team. together. Oh, wonderful. So this is the curatorial team at the center. Wonderful. Um, Namaste. Beginning from the far end there, that's Marika, who's our Namaste. assistant curator. This is Vijaya, who is our logistics and uh, curatorial officer. And this is Renu, who's our researcher. And wow. So we're just four people, but we work as a team I mean, of really. Yeah. It's amazing. And you'll also notice that all of the textual communication in the galleries is actually bilingual in terms of the panels. Yes. So um, these two really, you know, make sure that all of the. Uh, so I came here for yeah. the inauguration or yes. the launch of the book. Yes. The this was about four four months back. Yes. That was just a uh, uh, you know a hall which is nothing. Yes. And suddenly I come here and then it's completely converted, transformed, and you know a lot of time was spent on. Yes. Uh, the the way you set it up. I mean, it's, it's amazing, so incredible. The, the uh, transformation process. You know, how much time did it take? So the exhibition itself, we've been working on it for uh, you know almost a year, so start okay. of uh, 2017. But you know, we had preliminary meetings with lenders and all of that even the previous year. So typically, our exhibition planning stage goes on for about one to two years. But in terms of setup itself, um, you know, it's about three months when things are torn down and then, you know, it's all fabricated based on the design plans that we have. And then the artifacts move in about two weeks before because, you know, all of it has to be absolutely clean and dust free. Mm -hmm. And then we had couriers coming from the different institutions. All of it was installed in time for the opening. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's all something that has to work as clockwork while it all looks very nice. There's a lot of... I know. So how long will this uh, show last? The show will be here till the 30th of June. 30th of June. And then, um, so, so with the six months, seven months kind yes, of thing. Yes, six and a half months.
months or so. So, um, you know, we, we only do one major exhibition every year, but it straddles two calendar years. So if you were to come to IEC in any one year, the start and the end of the year, mm -hmm. you'd see two different exhibitions. Um, we're a community museum and we're a smaller scale museum, so of course we, we, we do things with our resources as best as we can. Whoever's watching this video, if they came to IEC between now and June, they can catch the Symbols and Scripts exhibition or they can catch the Chitti Malaka exhibition after November this yeah. year. So I hope they'll come and see us because we are a unique institution in that we're dedicated it to is. telling the it story is. of the migrant community um, vis a vis the source community and the connections in between. Um, so, you know, around the world, we're one of those rare institutions that's really looking at the migrant community and we'd be really happy to have visitors come and tell us how we can do what we're doing. Yeah. You know, this is my fourth visit, actually. I mean, if you. If, yeah. Yes. So, I am going to bring all my friends. I have a lot of friends transiting through Singapore. Please do. So, and, and, and I am going to bring all of them yes. because it's. it's I don't think so any other, uh, I mean I haven't seen so much invested by a government into the migrant community and given homage to, given that kind of respect. So we the kind of facility that this has been created is fantastic. Uh, and yeah, I mean uh, the two times that uh, I came uh, earlier with uh, Makranji also, we were just blown away with the kind of... Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. For doing this. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. It was just a fantastic uh, exhibition and thank you so much.